Before we get started, I would like to recognize that Willis Weber is with us today. Willis is Irving's son. He's in Iowa City this year from Colorado Springs. And so Irving, or I'm sorry, Irving, Willis, if you would like to raise your hand so we can see. We're so glad you're here this year. Um, I'd also like to recognize Daryl Albright from the Iowa City Host Noon Lions Club. Um, the Lions are instrumental in helping to plan Irving B. Weber Days, and we appreciate your work. Um, also would like to thank the Johnson County Historical Society, who has a number of events going on tomorrow. Um, also want to thank the Senior Center, Julie Seal, for hosting us today. There are refreshments out in the lobby after we're done, um, provided by the Senior Center, and thank you so much for your work for this. Our first speaker today is Connie Mutel. Connie studied biology and music at Oberlin College and went on to graduate studies in plant ecology at the University of Colorado. She's lived in the Iowa City area since 1975. Connie and her husband Robert, who's an astronomy professor, have raised their three sons in a woodland home near Solon. Connie is now a historian of science and engineering at the university's IIHR, Hydroscience and Engineering. She also writes about environmental and climate change issues for the university's Global Change Center, the CGRER. She'd like to thank the CGRER for helping fund the research upon which she, her talk today is based. Connie has written several natural history and environmental books, and she's active in efforts to preserve Iowa's remaining natural, space, natural areas. She's best known for her book, Fragile Giants, A Natural History of Los Hills. She's currently working on the environmental history of Eastern Iowa, and today's talk is based on quotes discovered while working on that topic. So please join me in welcoming Connie Mutel. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice to be here. Um, I enjoy doing my historical studies, but most of the time they're um, I'm buried away, as Lolly knows, in a library or deep in a book someplace. So it's always nice to get in front of a live audience and people who enjoy um, looking at the past and where it's leading us today. Um, I've been in engaged for many years in historical studies that trace the relationship between humans and nature. And for the past few years, this research has carried me into the study and into many wonderful quotes that describe the settlement of Johnson County and Eastern Iowa in general, and what that settlement did to the natural landscape, what the results are. And so my talk today is based on these quotes. In fact, the, the talk for the, for the most part is direct quotes, most of which were written between the years 1840 and 1900. And they were almost all written either in Johnson County or about Johnson County. Um, the talk is a revision of one that was given earlier this year at the Johnson County Heritage Trust annual banquet. Many of these quotes come from two Iowa City greats whose names you'll recognize, Thomas McBride and Bohumel Schimek, both of whom were wonderful professors who, um, who taught, were botany professors um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. McBride was also for a period the University of Iowa president. So I'd invite you just to relax, and I say this is a good talk um, because you can lean back and close your eyes and nobody knows what you're doing. Um, and just kind of revisit the past, not in terms of just people in the past, but in terms of what our land looked like 100, 200 years ago and what changes were taking place then. I assume everybody can hear okay, right? Okay. The book, The History of Johnson County, Iowa, published in 1883, opens with these words. Iowa, in the symbolical and expressive language of the aboriginal inhabitants, is said to signify the beautiful land, and was applied to this magnificent and fruitful region by its ancient owners to express their appreciation of its superiority of climate, soil, and location. This writer was quick to see that he had fortuitously landed, in a sense, in paradise, where the earth had concentrated resources, rich topsoil, rich game, wild game, clean water in abundance, and incomparable beauty, supposedly for his pleasure and success. There were many who wrote of these delights. As a whole, Johnson County may be estimated an excellent county of land, 
well watered and timbered, and abounding with excellent springs. The main branch of the Iowa River flows through this county, and with its numerous tributaries furnishes abundant water power, not only for mills and machinery, but for all purposes of agriculture. Big Grove commences near Iowa City and extends to the border of the old Indian boundary line. It has been pronounced among the best bodies of timber in the Iowa Territory. Johnson County then was dominated by prairie, which covered about 70% of the land surface, a bit less than the 80% state average. Prairies rolled across the county's flatter and rolling uplands and were described as a miracle of scent, sound, and sight, the likes of which are unknown in the Midwest today. In moister meadows, the green-fringed orchid waved its creamy spikes and the wild lilies tossed their fiery cups. Everywhere lobelias sprang. Later in the year, the composites took the field completely. The sunflowers spread their cloth of gold. The torches of liatris flared. The compass plant marked with edge-set leaves the meridian of the prairie and lifted its tall stems, distilling resin. In fact, one can hardly imagine today anything more beautiful than an Iowa prairie in full bloom under the summer sun. Only the fertile pastures of the Alps can show such wealth of color, and these, by their scant dimensions, hardly offer comparison. Woodlands also abounded here, covering most of the remaining 30% of our county. These were concentrated along the watercourses and in the more rugged area along the Iowa River north of Iowa City. Professor Schimmick reminisced about these woodlands, which he had roamed as a child. There were then still miles upon miles of almost undisturbed timber, fine white oaks predominating on the uplands, the hard maple occasionally dominating the river bluffs, and the red cedar finding an anchorage on the limestone ledges, while the black walnut and various softwood trees occupied the narrower bottomlands. The upland woods were carpeted in early spring with hepaticas and the rue anemone, while the ravines were decked with beautiful ferns interspersed with pink and yellow lady slippers and many other wildflowers, all in great profusion, while the lowland woods displayed their gorgeous raiment of spring beauties, mertensia, buttercup, phlox, and isopyrum, the whole making a wonderful flower garden. Both woodlands and prairies were alive with birds and mammals, many of which constituted food for the taking. One early Johnson County settler remembered the original abundance of wild turkey. Large flocks of them came to the barnyards searching for food, and the farmers set traps there, catching them in plenty. In those days, there was no need for anyone to go hungry. Another later wrote, the prairie hens were the most common bird over the whole prairie. All day long you could hear them rustling their wings. Every old resident must remember the abundant eggs with which the prairies were once strewn. And a little aside here, one of my favorite anecdotes that I found was a story about how the settlers would go out after prairie fires and collect the, the eggs of the prairie chickens that were already cooked and they would just eat them on the spot. Captain Irish in 1868 reported that the Iowa River abounds in fish, many of them of excellent quality and large size, such as pike, pickerel, bass, river salmon, and catfish, together with a great variety of suckers and fish of inferior quality. The fish were large as well as abundant. In 1862, near, near Iowa City's City Park, a 68-pound catfish was caught and a gar pike over four feet long was pulled from the Iowa River. As beneficent of this land was to settlers, they also feared it, especially the fires that were wont to burn through prairie and forest on a regular basis. When I first saw Iowa, wrote Mrs. Charles Irish, it was a vast expanse of brown and blackened prairie, thickly strewn over with the bones of the many animals that had been the victims of prairie fires that had recently consumed them while burning the rank, the rank grasses of the prairie. The deep snows of that winter and the warm, gentle rains of the following spring obliterated this gruesome scene by scattering beautiful verdure and flowers over these remains. There was good reason to fear the fire. In 1845, a settler wrote, 
Destructive fires were sweeping over the open prairie, threatening everything on the fine farms with annihilation. Smoke filled the atmosphere, and night was made luminous with the glare of the burning grass, which was so abundant. Fifty or more men from, the, from Iowa City hurried out to the assistance of their friends and to the protection of the stacks of hay and grain, now at the mercy of the flames. Yet others expressed the beauty of this presumed vector of death and destruction. Sometimes their coming was announced by smoke, which filled the air by day with filmy haze, and at evening rolled in cloudy masses down the long watersheds of the plain. More frequently by night, a pale red tint appeared along the horizon's edge. A light reflected, as from the sky today, comes to the traveler, the glare of the distant electric-lighted city. We learned the first approach by the ever-increasing smoke until at length along the skyline of our landscape we saw the painted flames like distant choppy waves over a sunrise-tinted sea. So slowly they came in, the very poetry of combustion as tuft after tuft of tall blue stem went up in lambent blaze. By morning, everything had passed. The blackened prairies spread for miles, far as the eye could reach, the image and reality of desolation. But if, once upon a prairie fire, the wind should rise, then came the storm, a fiery blizzard of destruction. The flames sped along the ground with marvelous rapidity. The air was burdened with ashes and flying sparks, and great smoke wreaths were rolled along in ever-increasing volume, darkening the sun. Whole hillsides burned as by a single blaze, and down in the valleys where the grass was high, the flames were higher still and the roar terrific. No living creature could stand before the storm. While creatures may have withered in the flames, entire communities flourished. Both prairie and woodland can ho had cohabited with fire for thousands of years. Without fire's cleansing pulse, changes were set in motion, the consequences of which we are still addressing. The woods of today, and today was written in 1830, 1895, this is 110 years ago. The woods of today are all thickets. To the old regime of stat or status contributed likewise the annual fires, which swept all grass-grown regions, forest and prairie alike, keeping down the natural increase of the forest so that only the hardiest of individual managed to thrive. Trees are now, owing to the substance of the, excuse me, owing to the absence of forest fires, wholly surrounded by second growth and do not show to the casual observer for what they really are. But if one can imagine, for once, the smaller trees removed and the ground beneath the remaining lofty white oaks carpeted with grass, he may even yet, at least in imagination, see the woods of Iowa when, their when through their shades the sack and the fox pursued the panting deer. Quotes like this give us insights into the natural processes that once governed our native landscape. What they don't reveal is why the changes were set in motion, why the early settlers arrived here, believing that this paradise was a set to be transformed rather than enjoyed even in the small part for what it was. Yet many settlers wrote that they saw the native countryside as un an unformed wasteland and ped penned adulations about settlement such as this. Go back and recall your first view of Johnson County. You saw a vast, unlimited, undulating plain with a small strip of timber along river and creeks with no inhabitants save the wandering tribe of Sac and Fox Indians, no signs whatever of civilization, just as it was at creation's dawn, lonely, desolate, still no sounds of civilization throughout its entire boundaries. Behold it now, ye survivors of the invasion made by you a half century since, and note the changes as by fair hands or enchanter's wand in 1890 you see an almost earthly paradise, a county containing nearly 30,000 happy, intelligent inhabitants, your rolling prairie lands covered with the fields of farmers on which you grow your corn, wheat, oats, hay, potatoes, and other vegetable products for the support of man and beast. 
Your orchards and meadowlands, your beautiful residences surrounded by all the comforts and luxuries of life, your well-filled barns and granaries, your stables of blooded stock, your pastures with herds of blooded cattle, with horns and without, fine-haired fine sheep, sheep, and last but not least, your high-bred porker <laughs> with his musical voice as he calls aloud for more corn. Your creameries and dairies, which turn out the golden butter for our bread, which would make the lips of royalty smack. These material achievements are the legitimate outgrowth, to a great extent, of your labor in subduing and cultivating the rich soil of Iowa. You laid the foundation and made it possible to build this unique monument of material and intellectual prosperity. Others express similar sentiments more succinctly. The conversion of the woodlands that Chimic had praised was described very simply. The settlers have redeemed the rough and hilly land along the streams from its useless condition of stumpy surface. The turning of prairie to corn and corn to pork became an almost God-given mandate through which, as one settler wrote, corn thus becomes incarnate. For what is a hog but 15 or 20 bushels of corn on four legs. <laughs> Certainly, some saw the havoc that was played by too many people changing too much too fast. Early Iowa City was, labor was later described in this way. One th once the town site had been a beautiful spot of the untouched wilderness, but carelessness has changed it to sorry ugliness. Streets were unpaved and ungraded. In dry weather, they became a desert of dust. In wet bogs of mud, untaxed dogs roamed the street, a good 150 of them. But the dogs didn't run alone, for hogs also occupied the entire town, rooting in the mud or sleeping on the sidewalks. And not infrequently, Capitol Square and City Park were grazed by the village livestock. And again, Old settlers say that the Iowa River used to be a clean stream, except during high water, but now it is muddy and slimy. In explanation of this change, it is said that the plowing and cultivation of the land causes more loose soil and vegetable debris to be washed into the river than could be washed in from the native prairie sod. Also, nearly every small stream flowing into the river is now utilized as a hog wallow, or else a hot day resort for cattle and the continual filth from these sources passes into the river and contaminates its waters, so that those kinds of fish which require clean water are dying out from this cause, but the nastier breeds can stand it and grow fat on the filth. That was written in about 1880. <laughs> Certainly not all settlers were immune to the changes exploding around of them, and some within decades of settlement were looking back at what had been with nostalgia. Above all, we have done with the wild fruit in Iowa is summed up in its destruction. Crab apples, wild plums, black and red haws, cherries are now almost unknown. Wildflowers have followed the fruits, several varieties of lady slippers, and not a few lovely ferns are almost extinct. Three kinds of no noble lilies that often were spared when they grew in patches so rankly that they spoiled the hay are now bought from high prices from, de by, from dealers of ornamental gardens. And again, let a stream be reserved where the beaver can build a dam and cut food to its heart, heart's content, where the buffalo may range, where the deer, the antelope, and the elk herd, and where every animal known in former generations may find a safe refuge from the murderous hand of man. To carry a war of extermination on the four-footed and winged inhabitants of the earth is a crime, the effects of which will surely be felt by coming generations, for surely this blood wantonly spread will be required at the hands of the American people. But few spoke with the conviction, with the strength of conviction, excuse me, the strength of conviction of Thomas McBride. The people would act today if the situation were clearly understood. The question is whether we do the right thing now or wait until the expense will have increased a hundredfold. The preservation of streams and springs and forests will one day be under undertaken as freely as the building of fences or bridges or barns. When that day comes, Iowa shall yield to wisdom's guidance. Forest and meadow shall receive each in turn intelligent and appropriate recognition. Beauty will become an object of universal popular concern, and once again across the prairie state, the clarified waters of a hundred streams will move in perennial freshness 
as toward the great river and the sea. McBride spoke those words 100 years, over 100 years ago in 1897. What good does it do to read them today when we're still waiting for the situation to be clearly understood and the people to act? And the costs of doing so, of returning our landscape to full health, have risen not a hundredfold, but many thousandfold. Is the study of our environmental history merely an exercise in frustration and futility, one that leads to depression about, what, one, about all that we have lost? I would argue the opposite that today more than ever, we must study nature's past expressions in order to restore our landscape to a functional and healthy whole. Many are involved in these types of studies and preservation struggles. The fight in Johnson County began only a few decades after initial, initial settlement in 1860, when people with a craving for the wild and untrammeled formed an Audubon Club to enforce the laws for preventing a wanton destruction and extermination of the game animals and birds of the county. And in 1880, a Johnson County Game and Fish Association was organized to prevent extermination of wild game and food varieties of fish. Sediments for conservation of the natural landscape rose to a flurry in the early 1900s when many across the U.S. realized that settlement had cost the country much of what had made it spectacular heavens fluttering with waterfowl and songbirds that were killed for their feathers and meat, most large predators killed from fear, and mammals such as bison and elk that were hunted for sport as well as food, as well as entire communities of plants. In the coming decades, many organizations were formed to educate and reunite people with the natural world as well as to conserve remaining natural areas. One of today's largest, the Nature Conservancy, is mirrored in our own Johnson County Heritage Trust, which was established in 1978, a small but increasingly active group that attempts to protect our remaining local natural elements and to tie us through respect to the creatures of this land of plenty. These varied conservation groups originally focused on locating remnants of the natural world and setting them aside, believing if that if protected, our native plants and animals would flourish. It's become increasingly clear that such benign neglect is in inadequate. The natural world described in my earlier quotes const consisted of a vast expanse of interacting species and processes. Birds migrating from one continent to another, far roaming bison and elk followed by cougar and grizzly, flood, fire, wind and drought constantly were shifting the balances wiping out a prairie or savanna in one place only to allow the establishment of a similar community elsewhere. Today, without landscape-scale landscape scale migrations and forces such as fire and flood, which both destroy and renew nature, our native prairies, woodlands, and wetlands are destined to slow death. These realizations have led to major efforts efforts to restore and actively manage today's nature preserves. We've learned that we need to interact with the land to restore the processes that once governed our land. To reconstruct hydrologies, impose disturbance, restore species to their rightful places, and remove unwanted invaders. This practice of restoration needs to become a part of our lives, our culture, and our daily activities, or by acts of omission, we will continue to press a hand of destruction on our landscape. My last quote was written earlier this year. I've been working furiously since November 1st, burning and now I've been clearing the westernmost sections, about four or five more acres. Now a trail leads through the middle of the cleared woodland. It gives a sense of the expansiveness of the western skyline. Blooms through the season, in May and early June, spring ephemerals, sedges, and those that follow, um, bluebells, columbine, waterleaf, woodland flocks, late summer and fall bring on the hyssops, horse gentian, cream gentian, asters, goldenrod, sunflowers, composites in general, as well as the grasses. Later fall brings out the russets, and after the leaves are lost, a sense of spaciousness and shadow. The redheads are still here in numbers, and the turkeys are thick. I slept out on the prairie on Saturday at zero degrees, and in the early morning, Coyotes howled from the north and south, and there were three groups of turkeys calling from three directions, and 11 deer passed close by. This was better than a national park. That was written by a retired Grinnell professor, Carl DeLong, about a 40-acre plot that he's restoring to a resemblance of Iowa's original savannas and prairies. 
Carl is a member of a growing group of individuals passionately engaged in reconstructing Iowa's pre-settlement landscape on small plots of land. These individuals and groups are looking to the past at an Iowa that once was to see what our landscapes can become again if we're willing. They're attempting to hear the quiet but persistent memories stored in Iowa's native soils and species. They believe, as do I, that only by listening to these memories and allowing them once more to speak will we retain an Iowa capable of feeding not only our bodies, but also our minds and our spirits. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. That was wonderful. We're going to do questions and answers at the very end, so you know if you have questions for Connie. Our next speaker is Lolly Eggers. Lolly was the director of Iowa City Public Library from 1974 to 1994 and oversaw the construction of the 1981 library building, which is currently being remodeled. After retirement, Lolly wrote a book to mark the library centennial in 1997, a, a book called A Century of Stories, The History of the Iowa City Public Library, 1896 to 1997. For the last three years, Lolly has been researching and writing a bi biography of Irving Weber. She will read an excerpt from her book today. Lolly's topic is Johnson County's first farm site, the Irving Weber Connection. Lolly Eggers. Thank you. And Thank you, Connie. You gave a nice, a beautiful verbal illustration of some of the things I'm going to be talking about in a much mon more mundane way. Uh, today's topic is John Ivers Birch, one of Weber's maternal great-grandfather, great-grandparents. <clears throat> My first chapter covers the four sets of grandparents that lived in Johnson County and Iowa City. Today I'm reading an excerpt from the first section of the first chapter about the Burge great-grandparents. I've had to cut out several sections to keep it to a reasonable length. There are no family letters, diaries, pictures. I was uh, lucky to find a Burge family tree on the internet. And the rest of the information is from local public records, census, birth, marriage records, cemetery records, probate, land transfer records, and the local history narrations of people like Frederick and Gilbert Irish, and then those who have written histories of Johnson County since then. I've given you two handouts, and let me explain those. Um, the first one is what I found on the internet about the uh, background that leads up to Irving Weber. And I've left out some of the details, but just the direct um, grandfather, father, so forth. And then a key to the box colors. The darkest, uh, the white boxes apply to people who are ancestors, but who do not appear in anything in, uh, that I'm going to say today. Nor wherever they may appear, but they do, weren't ever in Johnson County. The um, dark gray boxes are the Burge family uh, specifically and are the people that I will be mentioning. And then the light gray boxes are the rest of uh, Weber's forebears that are covered in the rest of the chapter. The map is a 1904 topographical map of Johnson County. It was the end papers on Manchime's book, Illustrated History of Iowa City. Um, and it has a nice, nicer feel and a nice contemporary map for the time period. I've put in some marks on the map just to sort of orient you. Of course, Iowa City and Coralville at the top and Lone Tree at the bottom. Who, who didn't, Lone Tree didn't even, wasn't even founded until 1872, so it's not that these places existed in these sizes, but just to let you know uh, where we are here. I've sh in orange, I've shown two north-south roads, Sand Road 
all the way down from Iowa City, and in Pleasant Valley, Shive Avenue. And then east and west, I have shown, again, Highway 22, just to sort of orient you, and then the other east-west uh, near hills is five today's 520th Street. And I'll refer to those a couple times when, <clears throat> uh, as I go along. I'm going to start with two paragraphs that open the chapter that apply to the whole family. Just as the Iowa Territory was opening up in the late 1830s, both of Irving Weber's maternal great-grandfathers arrived in Johnson County. They joined the first wave of Eastern Easterners who came to Iowa seeking the rich black soil, cheap land, and good life promised by those promoting the great prairies west of the Mississippi River. One of these pioneer settlers brought a wife and a family with him. The other was not married. Eventually, each would marry the women who became Weber's maternal great-grandmothers. Neither of these families, <clears throat> their descendants, nor the paternal grandparents who arrived 20 years later, accumulated great wealth or provided vital leadership to the fledging county. They were average, typical citizens. They raised their children, worked hard, and participated in the life of Iowa City and rural Johnson County through their association with governmental, educational, and religious institutions and organizations essential to a healthy community life. In a much less dramatic and public way, they represented the ordinary values that culminated, culminated in the life of Irving Weber. His Johnson County forebears, however, share some interesting connections to Iowa City and Johnson County history that could have provided Weber with some choice stories to tell had he decided to pursue them. And for the excerpt today, if he had known about them, because I am not sure how much he knew about the Morford branch of the Verge family. So we start. Uh, with my excerpt from the section on John Ivers Burge. John Ivers Burge farmed his entire time in Iowa on a portion of Johnson County's first known farm site. Although he didn't arrive until 1839, Burge and his nephew John Morford shared 480 acres of Johnson, uh, of Johnson County land that pioneer Philip Clark claimed on his first trip to the Iowa River Valley in 1836. Clark had selected choice land nestled between the Iowa River and Peckman's Creek west of the present-day Sand Road and south of 520th Street in what would become Pleasant Valley Township. And I have colored in some of the sections in Pleasant Valley that are where the Morford and uh, Burge families held land. And also the other section I forgot to mention that's colored in just south of, Iowa, of that's Iowa City on that map is uh, now Napoleon Park and part of, uh, of our story here. When Clark returned in the spring of 1837, he broke the frontier sod, planting some of the first crops harvested in the new territory. Why Morford traded claims with Clark is part of the story of Napoleon Johnson County's original county seat and first post office, and now the site of Napoleon Park in southern Iowa City. Birch left his Greene County, Pennsylvania home sometime in late 1838 and headed west with his first wife, Martha Morford Birch, and three daughters, Jane Four, Rachel Three, and baby Francis. The young family arrived in Johnson County just as it was being established coming to this area at the urging of their nephew, John Morford. John Burge's father, William, after a lifetime in Greene County, had died a year earlier. His mother, Frances Long Burge, had died in 1824, just three years after, three years after the birth of John's brother, Richard. So the 17-year-old came to Iowa uh, with, John, with the, the John Burge family. The Burge and Morford families had been neighbors for at least two generations, living on farms in the same or adjoining townships of Greene County. Like the Burges, the Morford clan had been in Greene County since the mid-18th century when they migrated from New Jersey and Virginia. 
Martha Morford Burge, born in 1812, was 20 years younger than her brothers, William and Daniel, so it seems natural that she would probably be closer to Daniel's two sons, John, born 1816, and Reason, born 1822. John and Reason's parents, Daniel and Catherine Morford, and Reason, traveled with the Burge family in their westward trek from Pennsylvania. Reason Morford would live with his aunt's family until he married in 1850, and the Morford parents lived with John and later Reason for the rest of their lives. At age 25 and 27, John and Martha Burge settled near the future community of Hills in Pleasant Valley Township, posting claim to 240 of the 480 acres of the land staked out by first settler Philip Clark in 1836. By the time the Burge family and John Burge's Morford in-laws arrived, John Morford was settled next door on the 240-acre balance of Clark's original land claim. How these two men, uncle and nephew-in-law, were able to acquire this historic, par historic parcel is a story that Weber never discovered, or at least never chose to disclose. After the 1803 Louisiana Purchase, there were many reasons why farmers left their homes and lands to become pioneers who sought a new law life beyond the Alleghenies, across the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and finally over the Rockies to Oregon and California. Thousands of Pennsylvanians, Ohioans, and young, other young Easterners left their family homesteads looking for premium land and a fresh start. It was not the hunger and persecution that drove European immigrants for them from their native lands, but curiosity, adventure, restlessness, ambition, and the desire to own their own place. Many had outgrown the space cleared and farmed by their elders, as the original holdings were divided over and over to provide for maturing children. Younger individuals could seek new opportunities free from the oversight of older family members. Men like Clark, as well as John Burge and John Morford, were leaving places where their forebears had lived for more than two or three generations. They, and what turned out to be thousands of others from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and points east and south, were rushing to Iowa in response to its growing reputation for rich soil and a better life. Less consciously, they joined a great migration in response to a changing federal land policy and the impact of the Louisiana Purchase. The constant removal and displacement of Native Americans to points farther west or to confined areas also opened up this new frontier. I'm going to skip the part about the land ordinances. For those focused on Iowa, however, it was the lure of the rich farmland at a good price and the state's growing reputation for its supposedly salubrious climate. Between 1836 and 1843, a bevy of writers and promoters, most notably John B. Newhall, who arrived in Dubuque in 1934, underplayed the harsh winters in, these, in their promotional materials and travel guides. Newhall, one historian wrote, sought to encourage immigration into Iowa by the time-honored salesman's pitch of urging the reader to run, not walk, to the nearest riverboat or covered wagon and head west to Iowa before all the best land was gone. Expanding on the advantages cited by Newhall and others, Iowa offered acres and acres of the best soil in the world, rated later as one-fourth of all the grade A soil in the U.S. A long growing season, rainy springs combined with hot days and nights of summer, many rivers, creeks, and wetlands, a blanket of snow in the winter to store moisture in the earth for spring planting, and a healthy wildlife population. Prospective settlers arrived in Iowa looking for an agricultural utopia and found land that was 80% prairie grass, which you can now picture from Connie's great quotes, with topsoil 20 to 24 inches deep, undisturbed for thousands of years, yet renewed annually, the tall prairie grasses contributed much more organic matter to the soil than those of the forests east of the Mississippi or the rocky soil of the eastern seaboard. While it proved difficult to break up the tangled web of roots on the virgin prairie, in the long run it was easier than cutting, burning, and removing stumps from acres and acres of the forest that covered most of the eastern states. 
the, east, the increased rewards at harvest time soon became obvious, attracting settlers to the area of the future Iowa, which was still in the hands of Native Americans. After about 1835, the wagons of settlers on the move lined the roads and trails of Indiana and eastern Iowa. When asked their destination, many replied, the Black Hawk Purchase, the land, of the, US, the land the U.S. government bought after the 1832 Black Hawk War when the Sack and Fox failed to retain their lands in Illinois and parts of Iowa. Actually, it took five more years before all of the future Johnson County belonged to the federal government following several more purchases from Sack and Fox. The 1836 Keokuk Reserve purchase included the Pleasant Valley area. The move west continued steadily throughout the 19th century, but in Iowa, the frontier progressed much faster than in most places. Iowa opened, was organized, and settled in less than one generation. Iowa historian Joseph Wall explained that if the Frederick Jackson Turner model of a single file frontier procession of buffalo, hunter, trader, cattle raiser, and pioneer farmer is used, then in Iowa the movers trod on each other's heels or walked side by side. It has been estimated that about 50 to 100 illegal squatters already claimed land in eastern Iowa at the time of the Black Hawk Purchase in 1832. Between 1833 and 1838, that number increased to 22,000. By 1850, the U.S. Census takers found more than 200,000 people in the state of Iowa. The Census Bureau declared the Iowa frontier closed in 1870. In 1836, in the early stages of the overland migration beyond the Mississippi, when few settlers had ventured as far east into Iowa as the future Johnson County, Philip Clark and his friend Eli Myers learned that the Native American tribes were about to sell and vacate another large tract of land west of the Mississippi. Bad, yeah, west of the big river, I'd written. They left Elkhart, Indiana, determined to examine this new country. Traveling on horseback, the two young bachelors passed the small village of Chicago and arrived on the banks of the Mississippi near Rock Island in September of 1836 just as more than a thousand Sac and Fox Indians were meeting with Governor Dodge of the Wisconsin Territory. Dodge's assignment, negotiate the purchase of the Keokuk Reserve, a 400 square mile tract retained by Chief Keokuk four years earlier when the 1832 Black Hawk purchase terms had been agreed upon. Clark and Myers had been planning to settle in the vicinity of Rock Island, but owing to a chance meeting with John Gilbert, they were persuaded to follow him across the Mississippi to the valley of the Iowa River where Gilbert had been living in Keokuk Reserve Territory as an agent for the American Fur Company who had traded with the Indians since about 1830 Gilbert has been described quote as the first white man to trod the soil of Johnson County after exploring the area they decided to locate about two miles south of Gilbert of Gilbert's first trading post on the east side of the Iowa River and east of the future town of Hills in what would become Pleasant Valley Township. And those two sections are in light green on your map. The land was flat with an abundance of timber along the Iowa River that bordered the area. The Treaty of 1836 may be memorable for the large gathering of Sac and Fox Nation, that had, the largest that had ever assembled to treat with the white men, as Gilbert Irish wrote. But it also marked the speed with which pioneers, eager to possess a piece of the fertile Iowa grasslands, were forcing the government to buy out and move out the Indians. In Johnson County, it is remembered as generating the first settlement in Johnson County and making Philip Clark and Eli Myers its first permanent residence. I'm sure many of you have read that story in other forums before. Each man staked out his claim, about 480 acres each, and built a very rough claim cabin upon the land that he had selected for his future home. As winter approached, Clark and Myers returned to northern Indiana and prepared to return in the spring with their team of horses and oxen implements, seed, plus enough food to maintain them until crops could be grown. Early histories note that they started breaking sod on May 20th, 1837, and planted 10 acres of corn and a goodly acreage of potatoes and other vegetables. 
After the crops were in, they spent time improving their claim cabins, built hastily in the, last, in the late fall of 1836. Clark and Myers helped spread the Iowa fever that was so prevalent in states east of the Mississippi in this period. Settlers from Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Kentucky, and other states were flowing into the area in great numbers. After hearing Clark and Meyer t Myers talk about the fertile land that could be had in the Iowa countryside, a substantial Indiana contingent followed Mark Clark and Myers back to the Iowa River Valley. The Walker brothers, James, Samuel, and Joseph, traveled with Clark and Myers in the spring of 1837. Henry Falconer, Pleasant Harris, and Samuel C. Trowbridge arrived later in May. Many other Hoosiers, some who had been in Indiana only a short time, checked out the area through all of 1837. Several returned to bring their families back to the soon-to-be-created Johnson County. During this same period, the young and unmarried John Morford answered his call to go west and left his Pennsylvania home sometime in late 1836 or early 1837. He crossed the Mississippi at Bloomington, now Muscatine, and evidently, while living there, met John Gilbert during one of Gilbert's frequent trips to the Mississippi River town as part of his fur trading business. In late 1837, with the number of settlers increasing daily and Johnson County about to elect its first formal government, Gilbert, Clark, and others began thinking about a town site that would eventually serve as the county seat. There were two factions, but both thought the best place for the town was north of Wapashashik's Indian Village, now the site of Napoleon Park. When Pleasant Harris returned with his large family and in-laws, he, he brought a plan for a, name a town called Osceola, with churches, a courthouse, a park, and a college laid out on, all laid out on paper. Most of the site, however, remained in the hands of the Indians until the title passed to the federal government on October 21, 1837, and the Harris group feared trouble if they tried to occupy it. Gilbert and his friends, interested in approximately the same track, used Gilbert's long-term friendship with Chiefs Powashik and Wapashashik to get access to the site. With the consent of the Native Americans, they built a small cabin. It was at this point that they recruited John Morford to move from Bloomington, live in the cabin, file and hold the claim until after October 1837. On maps showing the location of the project projected town of Napoleon, the two structures are generally labeled the Morford Cabin and the first Johnson County Courthouse. As the debate over Osceola versus no Napoleon heated up, however, Morford decided he didn't want to be involved in the dispute over town sites, and in early 1838, Clark and Morford agreed to trade claims. Clark and his brother-in-law, Peter Smith, moved into the town site claim cabin and proceeded to build a two-story two building. This building became the county's first courthouse, and Napoleon became the county seat on July 4, 1838, the same day that Iowa became an independent territory. Sometime in 1838, Morford either traveled back to Greene County, Pennsylvania, or wrote his Aunt Martha and Uncle John Burge and his other Morford relatives and urged them to move to Iowa and share the 480-acre claim that he had received as a result of the trade with Philip Clark. By late 1838 or early 1839, the Burge family arrived and took possession of their share of the land that had been chosen by one of Johnson County's first two residents. Now I'm going to skip the part about Philip Clark. His, his story is in a lot of histories and, and um, he kind of became Iowa, the first citizen of Johnson County for many years. He lived until 1891 and had many interesting adventures, including the one uh, Mrs. Norford is here from the Norford Mac Showers McAllister House, which is uh, set near where a lot of uh, Clark's troubles took place when he came back from the uh, gold rush. Myers died young, so Citi uh, Clark kind of wore the crown as the old first citizen. Because farmland dominated the Iowa landscape, it attracted more family units and thus more women and children arrived in Iowa in these early years than on other frontiers. 
The early census report verify both the gender, age, and occupations of early Iowans. In the Pleasant Valley Township report of 18, 1856, 796 people were, were spread over 170 farms with nearly as many farm laborers as farmers and a sprinkling of carpenters, sawyers, drovers, painters, shoemakers, plus one physician. 43% of the residents were female. One researcher claims that the typical Iowa pioneer was between 25 and 45 and had started his family before he moved to the frontier. In the first Iowa territorial census, um, agriculture pursuits claimed more than 80% of those gainfully employed. Uh, Gilbert Irish tells a story about the bachelors in the earliest part of, um, of the living here, which is a good one. And, uh, I, we won't go into it here, but it's fun what the bachelors were doing here and how they were getting along. While many early Iowa settlers stayed only a few years before joining the thousands and thousands who merely passed through Iowa on their way farther west, the Burge and Morford families represented those who chose to remain. After making the hard decision to leave Pennsylvania and a life connection to their family and friends in Greene County, they had faced the difficult task of selling their farm, uprooting their families, and moving to an unknown territory. To realize the better life, they envisioned they had to commit to the initial hardship and labor of starting a self-supporting farming operation. The news in 1839 that Iowa City had been named the capital of the new Iowa Territory complicated the plans of the early Johnson County settlers. Burge and Morford, like those who arrived before and after them, had marked their claims, were making improvements to the land, and planned to quietly await out the time until the U.S. government was ready to hold land sales to auction off the recently surveyed and mapped county. Nearly 400,000 acres organized into 17 congressional townships would be sold. However, the road to permanent deeded ownership of their claims was full of legal and financial landmines. These Johnson County settlers, technically illegal squatters in violation of federal law, realized that as the, as the territorial capital, Iowa City would attract even more settlers, land speculators, and others ready to profit off the increased importance of the area. These early claim holders promptly met to organize an association which, according to Benjamin Chambaugh, was distinctly West a distinctly Western institution created to meet the peculiar needs of their new trans-Mississippi life. To protect their claims, both Burge and Morford, along with Clark and 280 others, formed the well-remembered claim, claim Association of Johnson County. This group, consisting of almost all the claim holders in the county, adopted and signed their constitution, bylaws, and claim guidelines in March 1839, and then worked for four years until the land sales at Dubuque in 1840 and Marion in 1843 to see that settlers were secure in their claims. The organization kept careful records of land holdings and claim transfers and prevented claim jumping. This record keeping was essential because many early settlers claimed more land than they could farm often exchanged claims with others or sold parts of their claim to recent arrivals as a way to accumulate the money they needed to pay for the land they wanted. All in all, 425 claims and quit claims were recorded in the association's books. For claims made before the land was surveyed, the legal descriptions were in terms of creeks, rivers, and other major landmarks like large trees, and the names of persons holding claims bordering on the track. Two of the earliest claims filed were the quit claim deeds exchanged by Morford and Clark. Each valued their claims at $3,000, proving they considered it an even exchange. The descriptions of the tracts, although given in pre-survey terms, contain enough detail to identify both the Napoleon McAllister farm and the approximate components of section 23, 24, and 26 of Pleasant Valley Township land that remained in the Burge and Morford families throughout the lifetime of John Burge and John Morford. With the going price of $1.25 per acre, however, the price of $3,000 for 480 acres, even allowing for improvements, is unexplainable. Technically, anyone could attend a federal land auction and outbid someone who had lived on the land for as long as five years. 
But claim association members would show up in mass and protect each other's bid. The accurate records and constant oversight of claim clubs convinced federal officials, first informally and later officially, to protect their claims and give these settlers the first chance to purchase them at the government's base price of $1.25 an acre. I go in here into the 1841 Preemption Act, which uh, recognized squatters' rights, that eventually led to the Homestead Act of 1862. But note that this largesse, the Homestead Act, came too late for most early Iowa settlers. By 1862, only a small portion of northwest Iowa remained unsold. And of course, the Homestead Act gave them free land um, if they remained on their land for five years and met certain requirements. OK, skipping a little bit about how they financed these and some of the um, action at the, at the auction itself. Um, Cyrus Sanders, uh, who has written a lot, who was one of the men there and has written quite a bit about his experiences, ends his account of the sale in terms that all Johnson County Claim Association members could appreciate. Quote, we started home, many of us enjoying the comfortable feeling of being owners of real estate for the first time in our lives. Despite more than 160 years of land sales and transfers, the name of John Ivers Burge John Morford and other early Johnson County pioneers still appear on the county records as the original deeded owners of the land that they either staked out themselves or had traded or purchased from other early settlers before the official sales by the government in the first years of the Iowa Territory. As a Johnson County resident and landowner, Burge became a taxpayer. He paid $1.22 in taxes in May 1839 and joined 127 others as the first group to contribute to the resources of this fledging county. From this first small pool of taxpayers, Burge's name, along with Philip Clark, appeared on the list for the county's first jury. In May 1839, they met to serve as jurors for the district court, but with no business before the court, they reconvened as a grand jury and indicted Andrew Gregg as a counterfeiter and horse thief. And um, Irving Weber wrote a very colorful story about this, and um, I'm sure some of you have read it. In 1842, John Burge ran for a county office. He was one of three Democratic candidates for constable, but evidently was eliminated in the primary. No further attempts to hold public office are recorded, except that he held at least one term as a township officer in 1848 and 49. Amidst his early particip participation in civic affairs, Burge had to come to terms with his farm endeavors in order to stay afloat. Whether cleared by axe or broken by plow, claiming and taming virgin land while living some distance from markets and supplies was a formidable, ta formidable task. Like other immigrant settlers pouring into the county, the Burge family immediately engaged in survival activities like building a cabin, locating a water supply, and beginning to plow plant and fence, and fence in some of their lands. The tracks Burge and Morford had traded with Clark provided easy access to water and timber with the Iowa River running through the west edge of their claim. In fact, the western third of Section 23 is on the west side of the Iowa River, and the river flows out of Section 23, a little east of where Old Man's Creek flows in. Early maps indicate that half of 23 and 26 were timberland. Agricultural historians note that a little afraid of how to approach the prairie, many settlers chose tracks with at least some timber and more woodland areas, most woodland areas were chosen first. Even with water and wood at hand, they needed to provide shelter and food for themselves while conserving the money necessary to buy their claim when it came on the market or to pay off a loan required to secure title to their land. There are several things we may never know. There is no record of how Morford and Birch split the 480 acres. Therefore, we have no idea where Clark plowed and planted that first crop, or where he built the claim cabin that he lived in until the 1838 trade. Who got the 20 plowed acres, and who got the, carbon, the cabin? We also don't know if Morford gave Birch his share, possibly in return for bringing his parents and brother to Iowa. If some money exchanged hands, there are no early records in either the Johnson County Claim Association archives or in the deed records at the courthouse, although after 1847, there is a long record showing that both men, 
bought and sold various tracts in Pleasant Valley Township that were part of Clark's original claim. Farming was literally a sun-up to sundown occupation in the 1840s, and with only horses or oxen, simple hand tools, and enough hired or family help to ease the task. In a chapter on the development of farm implements in the 19th century, titled How to Farm Sitting Down, that's in Andrew uh, Allen Bogue's book that studies the 19th century Illinois and Iowa farming. Um, he lists the simple farm equipment of an 1830-1840 Midwest farmer. Wagon or cart, one or two plows, a harrow, a scythe, a cradle, an axe, a shovel, a fork, rake, plus yokes and harnesses for the working livestock. John's brother and Martha's nephew provided some of the early farm labor on the, far on the Burge farm. Richard Burge, his bro um, John's brother, did not marry until 1841 and owned no land until 1847, so he and Reason Morford worked alongside John in those first years to cut timber, build fences, and begin plowing some of the approximately 200 acres in the Burge claim. A diarist, Katura Belknap, uh, described breaking the tough prairie sod on her family's Van Buren County farm at about the same date. The family hired, or maybe bartered for, a breaking team with five yoke of oxen, with a man to hold the plow, and a good-sized boy with a long whip to drive them. Johnson County historian Honor wrote in 1910 that some homesteaders paid more per acre to turn the soil than to buy it. We do not know how the Burge land was broken or did, who did the job, but once plowed ground became improved land, and it immediately increased in value. Some, ex some experts say the farming family needed between 60 and 100 acres to support a family, and without professional help, they could only expand the land under cultivation at the rate of about 20 acres per season. By 1850, you know, he came in 1838, John Burge owned 12 oxen, so we can speculate that he probably provided oxen and manpower for breaking sod for others as a source of additional income, or at least he was breaking his own sod, not hiring others to do it for him. Farm, farm chores, li chores lightened somewhat in the winter months, leaving time to make some of the many decisions confronting Burge and other pioneer farmers in this newly settled area. Another thing they needed was a grist mill. F.M. Irish, Frederick Irish, writes how everyone in the early years longed for a, long, uh, for a local grist mill. Um, he says the clo I think he said, I'm not clear, I have to look my citation on that, that the closest mill was in Bloomington, 20 miles away, but his son Gilbert Irish says it was at Dubuque, 90 miles away. But it, was <clears throat> it wasn't until the Switzer brothers opened their mill in Clear Creek in 1841 that there wa was a grist mill close by. They operated on a cash basis only, and the mill failed after three years. And we all know about Walter Terrell and his mill, he got the permit for it in 1840, but he immediately left town and didn't get his grist mill started until 1843. Wildlife could easily supply meat and other products to the family until domestic stock was established. Honor mentions turkey, pheasant, wild goose, duck, squirrel, deer, otter, beef, wolf, mink, muskrat, and an occasional black bear. Irish had a longer list, but somehow I lost that and haven't been able to <laughs> refine it. But as the wildlife, they were the wildlife available in that area, in that era. So naturally, hunting, trapping, and fishing, like those big fish that Connie was telling us about, played a large part in any farmer's life. Burge became one of the early cattle breeders in the Pleasant Valley area, had a lifetime interest in raising and training horses, and by 1850 told the census taker that he owned livestock valued at $800, five horses, 10 head of cattle, half milk cows, his 12 working oxen, 20 head of sheep, and 40 swine. He was harvesting 1,000 bushels of corn, plus some wheat, oats, potatoes. He was also selling honey, wool, and butter. The 1850 agricultural census confirms that the Burge family made the soon-to-be standard corn livestock mix, plus some wheat, flax, and various grasses and oats, at least in those early years. By 1853, the Burge brothers were winning awards at, uh, for their horses, cattle, and vegetables at the county fair. Raising cattle and horses also provided some cash income. 
During this period, shorthorns were introduced and bred with local cattle to improve their weight and shorten their maternity, their maternity, their maturity rate. After several butcherings a year for family consumption or sale to neighbors, a farmer could sell his extra stock to newly arriving settlers or to neighbors, to neighboring farmers as breeding stock. Uh, Gilbert says that the, in those days, fattening hogs, they, they, they uh, were fed, lived off entirely off of acorns and that even part of the year that um, the cattle and horses ate acorns. From all appearances, John Burge, with the support of his family, was becoming a successful farmer. Eleven years after he arrived, he was recorded as having 180 acres of improved land and 290 acres of unimproved land, evidence of a lot of sod breaking plus substantial additions to his original ta ta tract. But life was short for many in the Burge family, and death often came quickly. John and Martha had four more children after arriving in, an Iowa, in Iowa. A fourth daughter, also, married, also named Martha, arrived in time to appear on the 1840 census. In 1843, their only son, John A., came and left the world in just a matter of months, and daughter number five, Hester, filled the crib again in 1844. Jenny, their sixth daughter, was born in 1846, and her birth may have been linked to the biggest blow to the family, the death of Martha, early that year. Martha, only 34 at her death, left John with six daughters, aged 12, 11, 8, 6, 2, and a baby. With about 120 to 30 acres under cultivation at that time, and six children to raise, John quickly found a new wife. Less than six months after Martha died, he married Louisa Richards. Louisa, six years younger than John, took on his large brood, and together they had at least three more Burge children. El Dorado, born in 1854, lived only one year. James W., born in 1848, was followed ten years later by daughter, by daughter Louisa. James, the only Burge son to reach adulthood, lived a long life and became one of the grandfathers of Irving Burge Weber. Brother Richard, 20, married Carolyn, Carolyn Walker, 13, in 1841. With no record of land ownership until 1847, Richard probably continued to assist his brother with the Burge farm for several years, or he rented part of John's holdings. Richard and Carolyn had four children before she died at the age of 26 in 1854. Richard died three years later. Two daughters lived to be married in the 1860s, but one daughter and a son preceded their mother in death. Many relatives of Martha Morford and Carolyn Walker lived in the Pleasant Valley area and extended help and support to the two Burge families. That's an assumption on my part, but they do show up married in this county, so I assume that their families took them in. Reason Morford married and left his uncle's farm shortly after 1850, but two young men, one another Morford nephew, worked as farm laborers for John Burge in the, the mid-1850s. The fate of Richard Burge's children is unknown except, as I said, his surviving daughters both married in Johnson County. But as important as this family support may have been, it is easy to understand the necessity of an 1840s farmer to find a wife to insist with the myriad of duties that depended on women in, an, in a farm operation. I'm going to skip two or three pages here uh, about the role of women since it doesn't, I can't tie it to either of these women. It's just what women had to do in those days. And uh, Iowa historian Glenda Riley has a very fine book about women on the frontier. So I'm just going to give you two short quotes. The first one, the choosing of a mate on the frontier was a matter of economic necessity, far and above individual whim. Good health and perseverance were premium assets. The woman who could not sew nor cook had no place on the frontier. And another one, she says, in describing domestic labor on the frontier as exceedingly diverse, Riley goes on, it was her responsibility to process the raw materials generated in the fields outside of the home. She was the key link in translating unusable raw materials into consumable finished goods. She was the equivalent to her family of the factory to an industrialized society. 
Uh, let's see. Where do I want to go from here? Oh, this is all about the women. The early deaths of Martha Morford Burge and Carolyn Walker Burge left two pioneer families not only without mothers for at least eight children, but also without partners for the family operations that depended so heavily on their contributions. Richard lived only a few years after his wife's death. John was lucky to marry again so soon. By the mid-1850s, the cemetery in the northeast corner of the Burge farm a cemetery that would be later be given to the Pleasant Valley Township, already held the remains of eight members of the Burge clan. I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, their participation in the fairs of Johnson County. Before his death in 1857, Richard Burge and his brother John took leadership roles in the Johnson County Agricultural and Mechanical Society, founded in 1853. Richard served on the board of directors that sponsored the first Johnson County Fair in 1854 on the grounds of Capitol Square before any buildings were there except Old Capitol. He was vice president of the board in 1855. John held several board positions throughout the 1860s. Both John and Richard received awards for the animals at the 54 Fair, and John garnered 12 ribbons in 1856 in the cattle, horse, and vegetable divisions. In 1860, John Burge received honors as the top producer of yellow dent corn at 112 bushels per acre. Um, then, and um, Alan Bogue does a good job of talking about the fairs and how important they were to the education of farmers, and that the Midwest had more fairs than anybody, and that between about 1850 and 1870 was a kind of golden age of fairs. Um, and goes on to say that later on, um, as the fairs, they were, at that time they were for education, not for entertainment. But entertainment crept in in the form of harness racing and uh, um, carnival attractions. But the educational element always um, stayed there. By 1860, just as an example, there were over 400 categories listed in the annual rules booklet. And the State Historical Society has some of these rule booklets from the fairs and all the categories that they were giving prizes in for both men and women. It's very interesting. But fairs retained their importance as one of the best ways to educate the farmer and help him improve his production. Even if farmers did not subscribe to local papers or to one of the many agricultural productions that flourished in this period, they came to the fair. Where else could they get questions answered by experts see a first-rate steer, or buy a purebred sire, uh, Bo mentions. And so then this last section is what these farmers did besides farm. And that was what surprised me the most, I think. While the record demonstrates, with their farmland, that is, while the record demonstrates that both John and Richard were serious about farming and determined to produce the best possible results for their farm operations, John and later Richard displayed a strong interest in more than just farming their land. Over the course of 30 years, from 1848 until 1881, just before his death, John bought and sold many parcels of land within the same two sections of Pleasant Valley Township that held his original claim. In 1847, Richard bought parcels in two sections of the township contiguous, contiguous to John's. Between them, they purchased sold or traded land 45 times, all within sections 23, 24, 26, and 35 of Pleasant Valley. Johnson County land transferred records before 1867 were lost in a fire, but the deed registrations survived. The price per acre varied widely, but it was always at least 50% more than the original $1.25 paid at the federal land sales. Both men sold and repurchased parts of their original holdings as well as adjacent parcels. When Richard died suddenly in 1857, a recession year when land values dropped, he was in debt for some of his purchases and it appeared John may have sold land to pay Richard's debts. Over the years, however, he prospered, buying more land than he sold. By 1875, he owned nearly 1,400 acres, all, of these, all in these same four sections, and worth in a highly fluctuating market from 8 to $15 an acre. In 18, um, 
I guess I better skip this. The, the next little part was about how John plats out a little town that's on your map called Morfordsville. It's at the bottom of section, uh, on the section line between 23 and 24. It consisted of four blocks of eight lots. It had a stagecoach stop. It had a post office until 1897. At one time, it had more, uh, let's see, 1860, it had, or 80, let's see, I can't see my date here. It had more, um, it had a larger population than uh, Tiffin, South Liberty, River Junction. We don't know what businesses were there, but um, it, if you look at other little towns, it probably had a blacksmith shop and uh, a, a general store. And uh, both Burge and Morford bought and sold lots in Morfordsville. What were these men seeking in this flurry of selling, buying, reselling, and rebuying their farmland plus nearby tracks? For most settlers, it required a decade or more to fully develop an 80-acre farm considered a quantity more than sufficient for cultivation by one man. It was 1870 before the average improved acreage per farm in Iowa reached more than 80 acres. But farmers were also speculators, and if they could afford it, they bought or claimed more than they could farm so they could sell off tracks to later arrivals via quit claims before the federal sales to raise the necessary cash to pay for the track they were farming. Later, they sold tracks in order to pay living expenses, to buy equipment, or sometimes because the price was too good to ignore. Then, if the opportunity arose and they had the cash, they bought more land to add to their holdings and waited for the price to rise again. Through census data on the average size Iowa farm, Robert Swinga, who wrote the book about uh, land speculation on the Iowa frontier, offers some proof that many pioneers bought large claims in the early years only to gradually dispose of their surplus land to relatives or through sales. He shows that the average farm, the farm, average farm reduced greatly from 185 acres in 1860 down to only 134 uh, in 1870, 1850 to 1870, it reduced that much. Several historians have studied these early land transfers. One analysis found that more than one third of the federal lands went to large speculators, and Johnson County had its share. Um, several Iowa City realtors bought acres and acres of government land, first in eastern Iowa and later in even larger quantities in central Iowa. Morgan Reno, Hugh Downey, Morgan Reno, I remember, because he, he was the mayor of Iowa City when the library was established. Hugh Downey, Charles and James Berryhill, Lee Grand Byington, John Culbertson, and James Gower all gained fame as Iowa City businessmen and secured great wealth with their buying and selling of land. In just one example, Morgan Reno turned a $1,700 investment in central Iowa into $200,000 between 1850 and 1860. Burge and other small landholders seemed to treat land during this period as a kind of stock market where they could speculate on land values as a way to increase their net worth. While they may have lacked the capital, time, or skills to play for the big stakes of the full-time realtor banker, they were able to acquire increasing acres of land. Typically, they could rent. Farm tenancy was a popular first option for the newly arrived or the second generation farmer hold for increased value, and finally have something to live on in their old age or to leave to their families. In 1867, John Burge sold one half of the northwest corner of his Section 23 uh, holdings to the Pleasant Valley Township. That's the uh, cemetery for one dollar. This had been the site of the Burge family burial ground since 1843, when John and Martha lost their only son, and it remains today the only cemetery belonging to the township. Through the years, it has been known by several names, Burge, Sandtown, Morfordsville, and Pleasant Valley. Entry is from 520th Street, just west of Sand Road. There are about 195 graves with death, death dates between 1843 and 1969, the year that the Johnson County Genealogical Society did their inventory. John Ivy Burch joined his family there in 1881 and is buried with his first wife, Martha. Of his eight children, only his one-year-old son, John, and his youngest daughter, Louisa, Bur Louisa Burge Smith, are buried there. There are several plots for the Morford family, including that of John Morford, who died in 1885. 
The grave of, el of the elder Louisa Birch, John's second wife, and Irving Weber's great-grandmother has never been located. She and John were living with their daughter and son-in-law, Louisa and Wilson R. Smith, during the last years of John's life, and Louisa remained in her daughter's home until she died in 1889. Because John left no will, under Iowa law, his nearly 1,400 acres of Pleasant Valley farmland were split equally between widow Louisa and the five living daughters of John and Martha. Part of his estate included in this, part of his estate included his last real estate transaction, three lots in the Borland subdivision located just east of the holdings in section 35. He paid $125 for the three lots eight months before he died in the fall of 1881. In July of 1882, Louisa's stepdaughters turned over their rights to these three properties to their stepmother, and Louisa immediately sold those lots for $400. It is not completely clear why this transaction took place, but if the county records are accurate, it is very clear that John Ivers Burge, some 40 years after he arrived to successfully develop one of Johnson County's first farm sites and to accumulate additional land through shrewd buying and selling of an area he knew best, had made one last great real estate deal, tripling his investment in just 18 months. John Burge, in conclusion, was the only farmer among the Johnson County forebears that produced Irving Weber. Nonetheless, farmers and farming would always be a regular theme in Weber's life. From the farmers he met at his father's blacksmith shop, to the summer he worked on the Fountain Farm on Sand Road near Napoleon, and the cows he milked for a neighbor when in college, to his life in the dairy business, creating products from the raw materials purchased from local farms, Weber eventually turned all these experiences into many of the stories he would tell about Johnson County farms, farmers, and farm families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lolly. Are there questions for Connie or Lolly? Any questions? Yes. The question is, do we have any original prairie left in Johnson County? Um, yeah, we do. We have the... Um, well, this is horrible when you can't remember names. What is the preserve out near Oxford? The Williams Prairie is a really nice wetland prairie preserve. Um, there are little plots, lots of little plots, um, many of them still in private ownership, uh, that people, actually the Johnson County Heritage Trust and others are trying to preserve. Um, there's a very nice sand savanna in Johnson County, which people would love to get in public ownership. There's um, a lot of work now being done at Kent Park to take, Kent Park it found, was, was a hilly area that's very sandy, is a hilly area that is very sandy and um, overgrown with shrubs, but it was, a lot of it apparently, or portions of it were never plowed and it was just grazed and the people out there now are restoring, to removing the shrubs and restoring and some very nice prairie is coming back. One of the exciting things in restoration is that people are finding that hilly areas uh, back from roads oftentimes might have um, good prairie remnants on them and if they're burned and properly cared for those even a hundred over a hundred years later those prairie plants start to come back so um, there are just a few preserves but a lot more that we're trying to trying to take care of if if people are interested in prairies um, prairies come out late summer early fall now's the time to go and see fantastic displays and if anyone wants to get involved in restoration efforts or prairie reconstruction, which means taking farm ground and planting a prairie, um, there are a few new efforts in this area. Um, Friends of Hickory Hill Park are going to do some prairie restoration in Hickory Hill Park. And there's an effort to get prairie established at the um, new water plant north of, just north of the interstate. And once established, that will become the largest um, city 
library, as I understand, in the state or in the country. It's going to be quite big state. We'll say country, why not? We're the prairie state. So there are efforts that people can get involved in. It's the, it, the real need is for people to get out on the land and to work, but there's a need for people who can't do that also in terms of education, talking, donating money, um, just working to advocate for these plants and animals that can't speak for themselves. So. Um, this concludes our 2003 Irving B. Weber Day's History Lecture. Our speakers were Connie Mutel and Lolly Eggers, and thank you very much.